morning, BCC, and a special welcome to all of our first-time guests that are here with us in the house or those that are joining us online via the live stream. Uh, even though I can't be with you this morning, we're traveling out of town with family. You're actually in really great hands this morning, and it's my privilege to be able to introduce you to our guest speaker for the morning. His name is Andy Storms, and he is the Vice President of Student Affairs and a professor at Ozark Christian College. Now, if you know, we've been a longtime supporter of Ozark Christian College. Uh, many of our people here at Bible Christian have attended there, and even some on our staff have attended Ozark Christian College, and we're so thrilled to be able to partner with them as they prepare men and women for future ministry uh, in the church and in God's mission field. One of the core values at OCC is making Christ known through the church. And they are committed. OCC is committed to partnering with the local church to accomplish the Great Commission. And I think you're going to see that come through and shine through even today as Andy brings the word for us here in just a few moments. So with all that introduction, in just a moment, Andy's going to come to the stage. And when he does, I'd love for you to give him a nice, warm BCC welcome. So let's all put our hands together and welcome Andy Storms to the stage. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, as you might guess, as the Vice President of Student Affairs, I don't usually get applause when I walk into the room. So kind of like that. That's new for me. I need to get you guys to uh, tell the students how to do that. So, uh, well, I am very, very glad to be here. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, my name is Andy, and um, we're going to um, be in Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to start finding that um, in your Bible or device. Um, but let me give you just a quick update while you're doing that on Ozark Christian College. Um, first of all, as I just learned or was reminded yesterday, it's a long way from here. Um, if you're driving, it's, a, it's four or five days, it feels like, that way. Um, but the good news is I was able to get a radio station with the Notre Dame game for the whole way, and so I was happy and occupied and uh, that was good. I grew up in South Bend, uh, so I'm a Notre Dame fan down deep. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but uh, we can still be friends. Um, but things at Ozark are going well, and I'm very happy to report that and glad to say that. I appreciate uh, Brian's kind words. Ozark definitely is and continues to be, has been for 80-something years, committed to training men and women uh, in Christian service to lead the church, um, not just how it was 70 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago, but how it needs to be 10 and 20 and 50 years from now. That's our commitment and our purpose and our vision. And um, undergraduate enrollment is going strong. Like many colleges, we kind of um, hit a little lull there as uh, going through all, all the COVID chaos and mess and I oversee housing at the college and can tell you it was crazy. Uh, college students um, living in a community and not uh, following all of the rules, as you might imagine. Um, we had a hard time for a couple of years, but uh, God has blessed us and kept us um, um, moving forward even through those difficult times. And now our enrollment is back up. We've uh, up over 550 students um, in our undergraduate program. Um, I even wrote some numbers down, including our online-only undergraduate degree. We're up over 615 uh, undergraduate students, which is amazing, and uh, trending up, and we're looking like a great um, freshman class even for next fall. Um, we're sort of ahead of schedule on that. So uh, God's really been blessing us. One of the things that makes Ozark able to keep moving forward um, is the fact that we remain to this day 100% debt-free. Um, which is amazing and has been a huge struggle for a lot of our sister schools. Um, but it's thanks in huge part, uh, like Brian mentioned, to churches like Bible Christian and so many others around the country, around the world, um, that invest their missions dollars 
in the college. And so we're so grateful for that and uh, really uh, appreciate Bible Christian and, and hope that continues and uh, love the partnership that we had. I got to uh, meet again Jake. Um, I didn't realize it was him, but uh, I preached many times, several times at least at the church back in Kansas where he used to work before he came out here. So it was fun to see a familiar face and an Ozark guy. Um, and so uh, grateful for the influence that we've been able to have here and the influence that you're able to have um, at Ozark, and those undergraduate students just continue to study the Bible. All of our undergraduate programs have at least 50 hours of Bible um, in them, even if they're going to do uh, worship ministry or children's ministry, um, and we're cranking out some really good children's ministry people. I know that's something on your radar, so um, hopefully we can fill that need when the right time comes, um, or um, pastoral counseling, youth ministry, preaching, of course, all those degrees, regardless of your degree, intercultural studies um, is going to have 50 hours or more of Bible. We want our students to be biblically educated and biblically prepared when they go out into the mission field, wherever that is. Um, and not only do we want them to know the Bible, but we want them to love the Bible um, and the Savior that the Bible talks about. Uh, one of the sayings that gets kicked around, and it's hard to attribute exactly to the right person, Seth Wilson, but when he said it and exactly how he said it, but the saying is a good one. Um, who we teach you to love is more important than what we teach you to know. And we put a lot of emphasis on what we teach these students to know but who we teach them to love is, is even more important, like the song we just sang out, saying we get distracted with a lot of other things, but we just want Jesus. And so that's what's going on on the undergraduate side of things, but I'm also very excited to announce that this fall, we started uh, a master's program, and we uh, were sort of um, expecting, you know, 30, 40 would be awesome. We have 74, I believe, is the most number that I found most recently, 74 students enrolled in our master's program. And there's information at a table out there um, in the lobby if you want to catch me after. But if you're interested in taking some master's level classes, or pursuing a master's degree, uh, we have an opportunity for you now through Ozark Christian College. And you can do some of it fully online, um, but we really believe a lot in the, um, the community side of things. And so most of the programs have some on-campus kind of intensive um, classes. So maybe once or twice throughout the school year, once or twice you'd travel to Joplin for a uh, four, three or four day intensive course um, but the idea is that no matter what your profession is, whether it's um, a non-ministry job, um, but you're thinking about maybe switching careers and going into ministry, or you just want to be more equipped uh, in your faith to talk more about your faith where you are, um, the master's program is a great fit for you uh, if you're on staff at a church um, and want to grow in your understanding of the Bible and some skills, but... Um, but don't have time to leave and uproot yourself and move to Joplin for a couple of years. That's what this master's program is for, and it's designed to help people with that. So if that's someone, so you are interested in that, or you know somebody who might be, uh, we'd love to give you more information. And I've got, again, a table out there. You can always go to occ.edu slash masters uh, to find out more information as well. So anyhow, that's kind of the, the commercial for Ozark. Um, our momentum is growing. Think good things are happening. Um, God is blessing us with lots of students, and we're so excited um, to be able to help those students answer the call on their life uh, to go into the world. So many people um, want to make a difference in the world, and they know God has placed that call on them, and Ozark is so happy to get to be the place where they can train and prepare to go out and answer that kingdom assignment uh, that God has for them. So, um, like I said, uh, one of the things Brian mentioned was, we've been supporting Ozark for a while, come and give us an update. So that's the commercial, that's the update, but I do want uh, to get into the Bible and preach a little bit today. So look with me if you have, hopefully, Ephesians chapter 4 open there in your Bible, and I'm just going to start in verse 17. Uh, we're just going to kind of pick apart five or six verses right here uh, and talk about what it means to really be a disciple and try to boil that down for us today. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, and by the way, I'm using the ESV version. Uh, normally I would do the NIV, but I, I like some of the phrasing um, of the ESV, so it's on the screens. might be a little bit different than what you have in your hands, but it's pretty close. Paul says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them 
due to their hardness of heart. That kind of sets the stage. Paul says, I'm not talking about those people. I want to talk about us. Well, I guess he goes on a little bit. They've become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practices, and every kind of impurity. Sorry, I, I, I got ahead of myself. Paul says, you know those people. We're not those people. I'm going to talk about us for a little bit. But he says in verse 20, that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which is being which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Let me say a prayer for us as we get started. God, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for your word, which speaks to us. And, and we know there are parts of your, your word, God, that speak to the world and, and, and correct it and challenge it and, and remind us of what we need to um, move our lives away from. But God, as we open up these verses, would you, um, would you convict us? Would you inspire us? Would you encourage us in how we can become better disciples of who you are, how we can make our lives look more and more like your son Jesus, who you created us to follow and to resemble. God, thank you for these words and help us to listen well. In Jesus' name, amen. I love that expression that Paul says in there, starting in verse 20. That is not the way that you learned. Uh, it's very appropriate and very applicable working with college students. We have to think to ourselves all the time, surely this is not the way that they learned. As Brian mentioned in that intro, uh, I do serve as the vice president of student affairs. Um, so I oversee really anything non-academic that has to do with students. Um, and one of those things is the housing. We've got six dorms on campus, three men's dorms and three women's dorms. And so I oversee those. And in addition to that, and how I started at Ozark is I'm a residence director. So my wife and I live in one of the men's dorms and serve as the, the RD, the residence director, the dorm dad and dorm mom is how they refer to most of us. When we moved there, um, Nine years ago, this is our 10th school year, I had three kids living at home as well, living in the dorm. My son was a freshman in high school when we started, and my two girls were in, so if he was nine, eight, seven, and sixth grade is what my girls were in. So I raised two daughters through middle school and high school, living in a boys' dorm. Yes, it was crazy. Yes, we tell them all the time, just you'll need counseling. Just we'll, we'll help you when that time comes. Um, it's okay. But we've seen these, these guys, how they live in the dorm, and we just have to, think, have to think all the time, surely this is not the way that they were taught. Some of their moms would be embarrassed, and they, they surely taught them to, you know, make their beds and fold their clothes and, you know, do those things. Get up sooner than two or three minutes before you have to be in class. Those, those kind of things, surely, surely they were taught better than that, right? We know that. We've, we're familiar with that, uh, that sense, that idea that this is not the way that you were taught. And sometimes it takes these students, you know, a couple years um, of training <laughs> to get back to where they were originally taught. Their rooms are messy and their clothes go unwashed longer than we like to think about. And um, that's just part of it. They were taught better, but they kind of forget. Um, my wife uh, serves at Ozark as the Director of Marketing and communi Communications and also teaches comp um, to the freshmen, comp one, comp two, and she'll just be sitting on the couch grading in the night, and sometimes she just sighs and she says, surely they were taught better than this. They don't know how to use punctuation, and they don't know how to use paragraphs, and they don't know. Surely comp teachers in high school somewhere taught them better than this. We forget sometimes how we were taught. Um, used to go play golf. This is a very less serious example, but play golf with the guys sometimes. It's been a long time, but um, it always cracked me up when, you know, the fairway and the hole is that way, and you see one of these guys lining their feet up kind of over here because they know their ball is just going to slice so bad, and they're just not even trying to hit it straight. They're just saying, I know, and there's got to be a, a dad or a grandpa or a golf coach somewhere saying, that's not the way I taught you to hit. You're supposed to line up and hit it straight, but they don't always do what, how they're supposed to do. Um, 
to use a preacher joke um, to talk about golf, bear with me. Um, my preacher in, Cal- in Indiana used to tell, talk about going and play golf with a golf pro one time, and they played you know the first couple holes, and he was excited. He thought this golf pro was going to help him out, and so he played two or three holes, and he had a couple good shots like you do, but several bad shots, and um, he asked the pro that was out there with him, what, what, can I do anything? What do you see? And he's like, you know what? Give it a couple more holes. Let me keep watching. Let me see what you're doing. So they played you know, through the rest of the front nine, got to the, the turn. Anything you got for me yet? He's like, no, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm still watching, still learning. Went through, played finally all 18 holes. And my, my preacher, Mark, said, well, okay, what did you... Like, surely there's something. And he said, you know, I just watched you play that whole course. And really, I can only think of two things that I would say... You need, to, you need to focus on, I think, to improve your game. I said, okay, well, I can do two things. He said, really, probably the two things you need to work on are um, distance and direction. <laughs> right? That's the whole game. Hit the ball the right distance in the right direction. That's everything. That boils, that sums up the whole game of golf. Well, again, cheesy preacher joke to get to the point. If we're going to talk about the Christian life, I think this passage right here, Paul boils it down not to two things, but to three things. If we're going to be disciples of Jesus, these are the three things that we need to do. It really doesn't need to be difficult. That song we sang, I'm sorry when I make it complicated, when I add things to it. Let's talk about the three things that if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, these would be great things for us to focus on. We're going to start, um, again, verse 20, I love. This is not the way you learned Christ. Then pick up with me in verse 22, and you can see my outline right here. 22, you were taught to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through its deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness, and holiness. If golf is all about distance and direction, then I think the Christian life, being a disciple of Jesus, can be summed up into these pretty simple statements. The first one, put off the old. You were taught to put off your old self. And the imagery here is just taking off your clothes, taking off a coat or your outer garment to take off those clothes that you've been wearing that are soiled and old and dirty and don't feel good anymore. Um, we see this same imagery in Acts chapter 7 when uh, the, Stephen has made his speech and uh, the Jewish leaders are getting ready to stone him and it says that they set aside their garments in order to throw rocks at Stephen. We also see it in Hebrews chapter 12, maybe more familiar, when the author says, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Paul says, get rid of that old self. Just take it off. Shed it like like a set of clothing that you're wearing. My daughter, my youngest daughter, Molly, um, is a redhead, and that tells you really mostly everything you need to know about her. Um, She's amazing. She's very strong, very opinionated, very smart, very thoughtful, very kind, but her level of kindness is to get right to the point. Um, and so she's fantastic. But when she was, I really think, less than two years old, my wife and I can't exactly pinpoint this story, but I don't think she was two yet. Um, and my wife had put all of our kids in the car to take them to the store. Um, so my kids are three years apart. So Nathan, my son, would have been five, and would have been three, and Molly was two, or right around there. And any mom or grandma knows getting three toddlers into the car to go to the store is no small feat. Um, and so she got them all in the car, ready to go, got to Walmart, gets out. Nathan and Ann were kind of big enough to get themselves out, but she opened up the, the door to get Molly out of the car seat, and there's Molly, red, probably, you know, little pigtails sticking out the side of her head, dressed cute with her socks and shoes, um, sitting right in her lap, which is not where my wife left them. Um, they would have been on her feet, but in the time between the house and the store, Molly had taken her shoes off. And was very proud of herself, I'm sure, because she had accomplished something. I don't know if her feet were hot or what, but she took her shoes off. And Amy opened the door and looked and probably sighed because she's thinking of all the work she had done to get to that point and said, Molly, I'm not very happy that you took your socks and shoes off. And Molly, and I think we've decided that like, this is the most fully formed sentence she had made up to that point, just looked back at mom as only a two-year-old redhead can and said, 
don't worry about it, mama, I can just put them back on. Which, A, she couldn't. She wasn't big enough to do that yet. You know, two-year-old feet don't put socks and shoes on very well. But B, I think that's a pretty good illustration for us in this passage. If you've been following Christ for any length of time, you probably have some skill at taking off your old self. You know how to do that, right? You know those habits, those tendencies, those sins that you need to get rid of, and you're pretty good at at taking them off, at setting them aside, at saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to live that way anymore. That's a part of me that I don't like, and so I'm going to be done with it. And Molly demonstrates for us that we're, we, can, we can do that, and we can feel pretty good about ourselves. But the bigger problem is how quickly we feel like we can put those sins right back on. We keep them right in our lap, right within reach, real handy, so we can find them again. And when Paul says to put off your old self, he means to put it off and leave it off. This is different than the addict who agrees to quit, knowing that they can just start right back up anytime the urge strikes. Or the gossip who turns over a new leaf to stop, but then immediately hears something that's just simply too good to not share or when any of us commit to being less envious, less jealous, we're going to be more gracious, but then a coworker or a neighbor gets some promotion or some bonus or some lucky streak that comes their way, and you just boil over with anger and jealousy and envy, and we're so good at picking back up those things that we have taken off. Why do we do that? Well, this verse tells us it's because our hearts have become um, corrupted by desires of deceit. These desires to put these clothes back on are deceitful. They're lies. And Satan has been doing this since Genesis chapter 2 in the Garden of Eden when he says to Eve, did God really say that you can't have this good thing? Doesn't that look so good? Did God really say you can't do that? Surely Surely he was exaggerating. Surely you won't really die. And from that moment on, Satan has been convincing us that our desires are actually good and they're actually okay. And yes, we took it off, but you know what? It won't hurt if we put it right back on. Our minds have been corrupted by deceitful desires, which is why we need point two of this lesson in discipleship, to be renewed. Ephesians 4.23 says to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. One commentator I read pointed out that this whole, the feeling this whole passage refers to a change in character in light of a change in identity. And that change in identity happens in the renewal of our minds. When we realize, when our minds become aware and accept that our identity is in Christ, our minds are renewed and they're transformed. And that is the gospel. That's the very best news that there is when we put our faith in Jesus and we say, I belong to him and I confess my sins and I want him to be my savior. Then he begins the process of renewing our minds. And sometimes it takes a while for our character to catch up to our convictions, to our salvation, but that's the whole point. But it happens in our minds. It happens through the renewal of our minds. In Christ, we can become something new and alive because God is in the business of renewing our minds. And I think the the battle for that in our minds is, is God's way really the best way? Does God really know what he's talking about, about life in 2022? Does he really get what it's like for us? And we need to be renewed in our minds in that. An illustration is cheesy, but the way that I would describe this um, would be uh, with my phone. Now, I have one. You probably have one. We all carry these around with us all the time, right? And they're very useful. They can do a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of the college students think the only thing they can do is take pictures and post them, but they can do a lot more than that as well. They're very helpful for getting us to appointments on time and reminding us of the things that we need to do. And when we need to jot something down so we don't forget it later, we can do that right there on our phone. Of course, we can make phone calls and texts and those things are helpful. 
And sometimes around the house, my wife wants me to hang up a picture. And I have to go and think, oh, I could walk all the way into the other room and find the hammer. Or, you know what? There's kind of some hard edges on here. I bet I, bet I could drive a little tack into the wall with the side. I, mean, I think I could. Like, really, I'm legitimately, I think I could do it, right? I think this is strong enough to drive it a little tack into the drywall. I think it would do it. I've never tried it, but I think it would. And I have a hunch that if I did that and it worked, now this is great, this is so much easier than going and find a hammer. I always have my phone with me and I just started putting nails into the wall to hang pictures. Eventually, I think my phone would quit working, right? I think it would stop doing the things it was supposed to do. Maybe the screen would break, um, something would get messed up, it would not connect with the uh, data towers anymore. And I might call Apple or AT&T, either one, and say, hey, my phone quit working. Can I get a new one? And they say, well, what's wrong? Well, it was working great until I started driving nails with it. And they'd say, wait, time out. What? That's not how it's supposed to be used. And I'd say, well, it works. It does it just fine. It does it just as well as my hammer does. And they'd say, but that's not the way it was designed to work. And I would lose that phone call. <laughs> Because Apple built this phone. They know the way that it's supposed to work. They know the appropriate uses and the inappropriate uses. uses. They, they know what's best for this device. And God wrote the user's manual for our life. And he knows what's best. And yes, it can be used. Our bodies can be used and our minds can be used for other things. And it's effective. It gets the job done. But God says that's not the way it's supposed to be used. And when you use it that way, it's going to stop working correctly and things are going to start breaking and falling apart. And this verse says that we need to renew our minds, let our minds be renewed to always remember that God's way is the right way to do life. There's not, there's not a shortcut. There's not a deceitful desire God's way is the right way to do a thing. When we continue and act like we know better or Satan knows better about how to do life, our minds are corrupted. And Paul says that our minds need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We must let him change the way that we think about who knows best in this life, about sin, what is sin, and really let it be sin and about grace. Let your mind be renewed about grace. Maybe you need to be forgiven for sin. Let your mind be renewed that God does that. And about obedience, what it means to truly follow him. Paul uses very similar words in Romans chapter 12. Again, maybe a more familiar verse. He says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you, by testing you may discern what the will of God is. The way that you're supposed to use your life, the way that God designed it, he renews our minds and helps us land on what is true about him. And then once that has happened, after we've taken off the old and we've been renewed in our minds, what's step three? to put on the new. We've got to replace the old with something new. I used to live in Southern California. Uh, it's where we lived for almost 12 years before we moved back to Joplin. Um, and we were about 45 minutes or so from Ventura and the beach, and it was great and beautiful out there, and I could tell stories all day. Um, but uh, one of the things that I liked to do, my family not so much, was to go to the beach and go spend a day in the ocean. Now, in Southern California, the water is always cold, always. Um, and so you go to the ocean to cool down in Southern California and take a hoodie and a blanket because it's going to be cold even in July. Um, we could always tell who the guests, the visitors were because they'd roll into the beach in June at you know 10 o'clock in the morning and it's 65 degrees and they were freezing. Um, but we would go to the beach and play sometimes, and you play in the sand, and I don't know if you've had a chance to go swim in the ocean, but if you play in the sand, and you go out and get in the water and splash around in the waves, and it's fun, and it's refreshing, and you come back and eat some snacks and sit on the blanket, and, but you always get sand and salt water, and if you've been there for very long, and then it was a 45-minute drive back to the house, and if you've been there in the sun, and you got the sunscreen, and then the sand sticks to that, and the salt water, and it gets in your hair and in your clothes and everywhere, Right? And so then you drive back home 45 minutes and you just feel crunchy and gross and your skin and everything. You feel sunburned and, and gross, right? Can you guys 
visually, imaginally, imaginatively put yourselves there. It's not a good feeling. But man, when you get to take off that bathing suit, and you get to take a nice hot shower and wash all that stuff out of your hair and off your body, and then you go put on your nice comfy sweatshirt or those, those clothes, your favorite clothes that just feel so good and dry and soft and warm. And that's the imagery that Paul gives right here when he says to put on the new, the most luxurious, the most comfortable, the most um, pleasant and relaxing clothes that you can find. Rich and luxurious is the language um, that this, this implies, to put on the new. It's your favorite stuff. Paul says that, to put on the new, created, he says, after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. What we took off, remember what we took off was gross and dirty and old and sinful and we knew it wasn't good. And now we get to put on true righteousness and holiness. Just imagine how great that feels at the end of a long day when you've been um, working out in the yard or you've been playing sports. Man, these boys come in after playing sports. They go play basketball or frisbee or whatever, and they come and sit in our apartment for a little bit, and they stink, and they smell terrible, and then they go, and they take a shower and come back because they might be going out with a girl sometimes. Um, Some of them get to do that, and now they smell good, and they've got on their good clothes, and they feel so much better about themselves, and we do the same thing when we take those things off. Luke chapter 24, uh, after the resurrection, Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven, and he says to the disciples, stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power. So power is what you're wearing all the time. In Ephesians chapter 6, he goes on to say that we are to put on the full armor of God. Same word, same image. And sometimes when we think about armor, we think it's metal and it's clunky and it's uncomfortable. But can you guess that the armor of God feels better than that? It must feel so natural and so pleasant and so strengthening and so powerful. My wife has a very fuzzy great big huge soft green blanket and she loves at the end of a long day to come and sit on the couch and get her a book and put that that blanket on all the way up to her over her nose sometimes and she'll fall asleep like that with her nice big soft comfy blanket on that's what paul is saying to put on the new the good news is that when we have taken off the old and we've been renewed in our minds, what we get to put on is true righteousness and holiness. Who wouldn't want to wear those clothes? So how do we do that? Let me give you just two quick, easy steps. We know how to take off the old. We know how to do that. We're pretty familiar with how to put on the new, but let me give you two kind of parting thoughts, okay? First thought, you do your part. How do we do this? You do your part. You are the one that's responsible to take off the old and put on the new. Let me tell you a little bit, because my wife is a comp teacher and grammar nerd, um, some grammar about this passage. There are verbs, put off, be renewed, put on. Those are verbs, and we're familiar with that. Verbs are action words, right? They do something. And we're familiar with active verbs. Those are things that we do outwardly, right? We do to something or out there. We do outwardly, active verbs. The Greek has a verb voice that's called the middle voice. And these two of these uh, instructions to take off the old and put on the new, those are in the middle voice. Those are verbs that we do to ourselves. We do them inwardly. We don't do them outwardly. And no one can do that to me. No one can take off my old and put on my new. It's in the middle voice. I do that for and to myself. And so you do your part. No one can take off the old for you. That's your job. Set aside those behaviors that Paul mentioned at the beginning of our passage, verses 17 through 19. Get rid of those things. Take those things off. Stop doing those things. That's your job. And start doing the new things. Start living in obedience to the way God has called you to do. That's your job. You do your part. But let God do his part, which is the middle verb. 
And it's not in the middle voice, something that you do to yourself. It's in the passive voice, which is something that someone else does to you. Just like Molly was not able to put her socks and shoes on herself. It took someone else to do that. God is the only person who can renew your mind. That's his work. And I believe we have to ask him to. We have to make ourselves willing for that. We have to um, be humble enough to receive that. We got to sit there while he does it. But that's his job. And I'm asking you, that's the application, that's the challenge today, to let him, to put yourself in a position of submission, to let God constantly, continually renew your mind. Maybe there are people in the room who haven't ever done that. You've been holding on to your own mindset, and God, I'm going to figure this out for myself, and I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to pray as much as I can. I'm going to go to classes and conferences and retreats, and I'm going to figure out how to renew my own mind. The invitation today is for you to surrender, for you to say, God, it's not working, and I need you to come in and renew my mind. And some of you have done that, and you will continue to do that. And so let's do that again. Let's commit to that again. And the challenge for you is to every day put on the new over and over because it's, it's comfortable, it's relaxing, it's powerful. It's what God intended for you. It's his very, very best. You do your part. Let God do his part and watch the Holy Spirit move in your life powerfully. Let me pray. God, I thank you that you are willing to renew our minds, and we know our minds, and we know how distracted they can be, how wrong they can be, how stubborn they can be, how sinful they can be, and so God, I ask and pray that you would help us, help me to be willing to let you renew our minds, and God, as you do that, then we commit as individuals and as a church family to put on the new, so that when people see us and our lives and our families, and when they see Bible Christian Church out in this community, they will see true righteousness and holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.